All right, amen. Well, we're in Judges chapter number 13, and we're going to start off by talking about this encounter between Manoah, his wife, and the angel of the Lord. And um, look down at verse number 18, if you would. And so it says this, it says, And the angel of the Lord said unto him, that is Manoah, Why askest thou thus after my name? Now, don't miss this, seeing it is secret. Seeing it is secret. You ever read that and kind of wonder why that's in there? And uh, that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. We're going to be talking about the subject of confidentiality or privacy, right? Um, obviously, you know, there's a lot that goes into this. There are things that we need to be uh, private and need to keep confidential. Um, but there's also a time to where we need to breach that and we need to make sure that we tell, you know, these secrets if they're going to hurt somebody, if you would. But um, here in the story here, the angel of the Lord first appears unto Manoah's wife, right? Gives her instruction. She comes back. She's excited. And what does she mention to Manoah? She mentions to him, hey, you know, this is what he told me, but he didn't tell me his name. Kind of interesting, right? Because obviously back in that time, even in our culture, when you first meet somebody, you kind of want to get their name. You kind of want to like know a little bit about them. And that stuck out to her. So he begins to pray to the Lord and make petition and ask God to send the angel of the Lord back so that he can get more information and hear it for himself. And you know, you can't blame the guy. We'd all do the same thing, you know, especially the way that she described him. You know, he had a terrible countenance, just not quite normal, right? Something very different about this guy. So God grants his petition, sends the angel of the Lord back, and then he asks the angel of the Lord, well, hey, what's your name, right? And any one of us would probably do the same thing, but I like what he says here. He says, why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is secret? And so the angel of the Lord is trying to teach us something here, and that is, you know, when you are around somebody, or some, you could tell that somebody's maybe trying to keep something back that they don't want you to know, we ought to be very careful about prying into that, right? Trying to get them to spill the beans or cough it up, you know, because we don't want to be bullies. We don't want to try to always be the kind of people that are extracting secrets from people, right? Or basically making invasions on people's privacy. It's not a, a good way to be. Now, the title of the sermon this morning is this, and I didn't come up with this. This is a, a old popular idiom, but it's loose lips sink ships. Loose lips sink ships. Now, loose lips refers to basically having a big mouth. And we all know this, you got a big mouth, you're susceptible to ruining, uh, you know, small acquaintances all the way up to long, hearty relationships. Okay. That's what that's referring to there and sinking ships. Well, that refers to actually sinking literal ships or just sinking any project that you're working on, any private information that you might have, um, with other people. Okay. And so this is important that we maintain this level of confidentiality as a church because we want this place to be a safe haven. We've all got problems. We've all got things that we need to work on. We've all got things that we're not proud of that we do. And this ought to be a place where we can come to and confide in other people, get help, get the support that we need, right? So that we can grow as the children of God. And so that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. Now, you could go ahead and leave your place there out of Judges 13 and turn to Proverbs chapter number 12. Proverbs chapter number 12. I used to see these signs when I was working for the Navy on board ship all the time, you know, loose lips sink ships, loose lips sink ships. I don't think there's a ship out there or an office, uh, you know, in the Navy without this poster. And there's a huge reason for it, you know, with the technological advances today, um, it's much easier to go ahead and try to obtain information from people. And to make matters even worse, the attitude of most people today is that of what? Selfishness right? People are very selfish today and they only care about themselves and how they feel in the moment. And so with that being said, a lot of people today in our military, in, uh, in our government sectors, they have a very difficult time keeping secrets. And when this information gets out, it's catastrophic. You give the enemy the, you know, the, the wrong information, they can go ahead and in turn use that against us, use that against our people. And then what happens? Nothing good at all. I mean, think about it. You know, when you learn something about somebody, like someone's going to propose to their girlfriend, right? You get excited. Well, at least the ladies do, you know, the guys are like, oh, I'll just hurry up and do it already. But, you know, you know, you get excited and it's hard to keep that in, you know, or somebody's, hey, I'm with child. You know, it's hard to keep that in. Somebody says, hey, I, I got this new job, but I don't want to tell anybody just quite yet because, you know, they've been praying. I want it to be a surprise. When you get that information, right, don't you find it hard oftentimes to really keep that inside? I mean, it's a work. You've got to work hard at it. Well, why is that? 
Why is that? It's, and guess what? It's 10 times worse when it's dirt on somebody, isn't it? <laughs> when you got the dirt on somebody, ooh, man, it's hard to keep that in. It's a struggle. It's a fight. You want to let other people know. And the Bible gives us the reasons why we are like that, okay? And we'll, we're going we're gonna to talk about that here in a moment. But you're there in Proverbs chapter number 12. Look at verse 23. It says this, A prudent man concealeth knowledge, but the heart of fools proclaimeth foolishness. Okay, so lacking understanding of this subject, the subject of privacy, the subject of confidentiality, when we lack understanding in this, guess what happens? We run the risk of being foolish. That's exactly what this verse is talking about. A prudent man. What does a prudent person do? A prudent person is somebody who is wise, somebody who looks well to their going, who thinks about the things that they're going to do before they do them. It's a person who acts versus reacts, okay? Now, obviously, you know, you think, okay, well, I'm saved and I've, I've, got, I've got prudence. And that's the biggest problem is that we just think because we're saved and we go to church that we have this. This is a work. Right? It's not like you get saved, like you get born again, you start coming to church and you're automatically going to be prudent. Look, we have to learn how to behave constantly. It's why we have three services a week. This is why we preach on things like this multiple times throughout the year, because it's a work. It's not automatic. And I think that when we realize that, I think it's going to help us to really understand the importance and the value. Hey, it's not just something wrong with me. We all struggle with keeping things private because why? Well, we want to tell. We like how that information makes us feel, right? And so then in turn, we want to go ahead and make somebody else feel good, you know, with the good secrets. Now, when it comes to the dirt, that's a whole different ball of wax. The reason why we struggle with that is because we have the old man. We have the old nature. And that old man likes to be lifted up. And when you can see an opportunity to put somebody else down, that old man's like, yes, see, you're not as bad as that dirt bag, even though you you are in a lot of cases, right? And so what happens is, you know, that selfish attitude, it just comes over us. We're in the flesh and we like how that secret information makes us feel. And we're like, you know what? Let's just go blab about that. But there's a huge, huge problem with that attitude. And I'm going to show you that here in a moment, but turn to Proverbs chapter number 25. <laughs> Proverbs chapter number 25. So we can see that a prudent person, somebody who is wise, has the restraint, has the ability to keep things secret, to keep things confidential. And please keep in mind, these aren't things that are going to hurt other people. These are things that other people have confided in you with, have trusted you with, and you have the ability to maintain that secret to protect that other person. Okay. And so obviously right off the bat, you can see how much humility plays a part in being a prudent person that can conceal of knowledge, okay? Now, I've told this story before. Uh, I, I used to work for the government. I've had a, a top secret security clearance in the past. I've had one that was a little bit different than top secret. And, you know, a lot of times people ask me, like, well, do you know, like, what goes on at Area 51? It's like, I have no clue, okay? You know, where I used to work, let's say, for example, I'm working on a submarine project, and I get a top secret security clearance. Somebody on the next dry dock's working on an aircraft carrier. They have a top secret security clearance. Both of us could get into a room, and we're, gonna, we're not even going to be able to communicate. Right? That's how that thing works. And besides, anything top secret that I know, like most of it, is stuff that would just put you dead to sleep. But if the wrong people found out about that information, it would be very, very bad for our country. You know, and that's what they used to tell us all the time when I worked for the government. And it's like, okay, great, I get it. You're worried about us down here that are, you know, running our mouths or whatever. But then they show you pictures of Chinese submarines and Chinese fighter jets, and they look exactly like ours. Gee, I wonder how that happened. Somebody at the top with big pockets obviously has loose lips. You know, and they would always bring us into these briefings and show us, look at this, because of you guys, because of people that run their mouths, the Chinese now have the same capabilities that we have. And they're working on an aircraft carrier platform. They're working on these missiles and they're working on all these things. And it's because of people like you that can't keep your mouth shut. It's like, no, you need to go up the ladder a little bit farther. That's what you really need to do, Bozo. But, you know, this doesn't just apply to the government. Many of you have had jobs where maybe you've worked at a factory or you've worked at some kind of a food plant and they've had some sort of a proprietary, you know, recipe. Like I went to Bigelow Tea not too long ago and, you know, they make you sign all this stuff. Anything you see here has got to be confidential. You got to keep it secret and stuff like that. And I'm like, oh, this is weak. Nobody cares about Bigelow Tea. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But you can see that, you know, a lot of those people, you know, they have to sign a waiver basically saying, hey, I won't give up the secret recipe. 
because it could be tempting to do that, to make profit and to basically get back at your employer or whatever. But anyways, we all struggle with this type of thing. You know, some of you have given away your grandma's recipe and she's mad at you, upset. And, you know, we need to kind of learn how to not be like that. <laughs> so Proverbs chapter 25, look at verse number nine. This is the verse that's on the bulletin. Proverbs 25, look at verse number nine. It says this, debate thy cause with thy neighbor himself and discover not a secret to another. Now look at verse 10. Lest he that heareth it put thee to shame in thine infamy, turn not away. So when you back up to verse number nine, it says, hey, debate your cause, settle your dispute, settle your beef with your neighbor, with your brother, with your sister in Christ and discover not a secret to another. So here's what this means. You know, it's okay for us to have disagreements. It's okay for us to have discussions and maybe a little bit heated discussions, but you know what? We can conceal that matter. We don't have to immediately leave that discussion and come to church and be like, hey, guess what? You know, I put so-and-so down. He was wrong on this doctrine. What an idiot. You know what I mean? We don't need to do that because all that does is give us this thing here in verse 10, where he says, lest he that heareth it put thee to shame and thine infamy turn not away. That word infamy there, that just means an evil reputation, a disgrace, dishonor. And you all know that this is so true. When somebody comes up to you and they're always talking about someone else, right? Instinctively, you don't trust that person, right? You don't trust that person. And that is exactly what I'm talking about. That is exactly the attitude and the type of person that we don't want to be because it's destructive at best. That's all it is. It gives us an infamous reputation. And we don't want to be a church known for infamy, you know, like, especially in this context here, it's okay to have beef with somebody and just keep it private. Just settle your disputes. You know, back in the, in the days, like when my, my parents were growing up, you know, this was like a thing, like people could like argue with each other and then they could come to church and just be friends again. But it seems like now everybody wants to be like little schoolgirls, you know, and get on Twitter, get on Facebook and, oh, you know, this person sucks. And look, I'm going to throw a quick disclaimer out there. I'm not talking about anything going on in the new IFB right now. I'm just preaching what the Bible says. Okay. I don't know if there's something going on in here about people running mouths. I don't know about it. I wish I did. So somebody needs to tell me that this is, that, that's the situation where you need to come up and let me know. But you know, I'm just basically saying it's okay to have a little dispute, to have a little argument and then just move on with it. You know, just let that thing go, settle it out, hash that thing out. And you don't have to go tell everybody that you have this discussion to put that person down is very wrong. And here's the bottom line for the sermon. When I take that, which is confidential and make it common, I have ruined my reputation. When I take that which is confidential and make it common, I have ruined my, um, my, blah, sorry, mouth is still dry. I'm used to that Texas weather. I've ruined my reputation, okay? That is a good way to sum up these two verses. So we need to realize that when somebody comes to us and they have a problem and they're telling us something, you know what? When we go out and we speak about that in front of other people that don't need to know it, you know what? You may not realize that at the time, but you have ruined your reputation. You're making yourself not trustworthy. Now you can leave your place there, but keep something in Proverbs because we're going to come back to it and go to Matthew chapter number nine, Matthew chapter number nine. You know, it's often been said that we can't, we can't trust other people based off of what they tell us because the Bible says, you know, every man will proclaim his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find, right? Yeah. right? People have no problems coming up to you and telling you their resume. Hey, I did this. I've done this. I've done all this stuff. You know, I'm the best. I'm the greatest. I just want you to know, you know, we can't trust that. Can we? We've learned that here in this church. If there's one thing that we've learned in two years, it's that you just because somebody comes in here and starts saying that they've done all the stuff that oh, I've read the Bible multiple times. I've watched a million sermons. I, oh man, I know how to give the gospel. Okay. Well, let's just see it first, right? We can't trust that. But you know what we can judge? You know what we can trust is what they tell us about other people. If they're quick to always come to you and just run their mouth about every conversation that they've had with everyone else in their life in church, you know what? That signals to us, hey, that's somebody that we cannot trust. That is somebody who has damaged their reputation. And oh, how hard it is to bring that reputation back under control once you've done that. Right. I mean, once you've breached that reputation in front of people, especially in a church, it is very hard to get that thing back. And so why go down that road in the first place? Okay. 
And so we're going to move on here. I want you to look at Matthew chapter 9 in verse number 26. And so the context here, Jesus is doing miracles, healing people here. And I want you to notice a few things about this passage here, but look at verse number 26. It says, In the fame thereof, or I'm sorry, in the fame hereof went abroad into all that land. Verse 27. And when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And so what Jesus and the disciples right now are experiencing is fame. And one thing that that's doing is it's restricting their mobility. It's restricting their movement. Look at verse number 28. It says, And when he was come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus saith unto him, Believe ye that I am able to do this. They said unto him, Yea, Lord. Verse 29. Then touch ye their eyes according to your faith, I'm sorry, according to your faith, be it unto you, verse 30, and their eyes were opened, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, see that no man know it. So what does that mean there when Jesus said, hey, don't do, don't tell anybody about this. The Bible says he straightly, he straightly told them, don't speak about this. Well, it means he directly told them. Okay, it means he gave them a stern warning. Hey, don't go tell people about this encounter. Look at verse number 31. But they, when they were departed, spread abroad his fame in all that country. And look, I, you know, if you put yourself in these shoes here, you've got some kind of ailment. I, I would do it. I'd be like, I'm sorry, Lord, but I'm going to have to take the loss on this. I got to tell everybody, you know, I mean, we're weak. Okay, we're weak. But that doesn't negate the fact that there isn't a lesson for us to learn in this passage here. So why is he ever wondered about that? Why does this happen? Because as you're reading the Gospels, you know, Matthew 16, 17, there's several places in the Gospels where Jesus tells the disciples not to say things where he tells other people, hey, keep this, you know, go see the priests, you know, and he's doing that for a purpose. But why is it that we always got, oh, we just, just got to break protocol and go tell everyone? Why is that? Why do they do that here? Why did Jesus want this to be kept secret? And I'll tell you, it's because he didn't want the people to focus on the miracles over the message. Okay, so there's a reason why he's telling this. It's not that the miracles aren't important, but the message is more important. And the more miracles he does, and the more people that come to him just for that, the more his fame grows, the shorter his ministry is going to become, and the less effective it's going to become. And so what does this mean for us? And here's the first point that I want to make this morning which is this, when we have loose lips, we sink our discipleship. Okay, when we have loose lips, we sink our discipleship. And you say, well, what in the world does that mean? We'll turn to Philippians chapter number two. Philippians chapter number two. Well, just like in this passage here, because they violated the commandment of the Lord Jesus Christ, what happened? Well, now more multitudes of people are seeking them and they're having to sneak around the country just to get the message out. Okay? And this can be a problem in churches a lot of times, especially a church that maybe, you know, their sole focus is just, we've got to be known on social media. We've got to be known out in the community for whatever reason, right? Oh, we're just all about love. We don't judge here, right? And they spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on advertising that fact. Well, guess what gets compromised in the meantime? The message, the gospel message, because now you have hordes and droves of idiots coming to these churches just looking for a little bit of comfort in the physical, right? They're not going to get anybody up in front and tell you, hey, guess what? You're lost and you're on your way to hell, right? The mission, the, I'm sorry, the message always gets compromised when we have loose lips, when we can't control what is important. Now, look at Philippians chapter two and verse number five, very familiar verses. It says this. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. So the right way to protect our discipleship is to have this same mindset in us, Amen. which is where we Take it upon ourselves to say, you know what? We're just going to let God do the promoting. We're going to let him build our reputation. And we're going to focus on the message over the miracles. And obviously, I'm not saying, you know, like some Pentecostal church, you know, I'm going to perform miracles. We're going to get snakes up here. We're going to start speaking in tongues and all this other stuff. I'm not saying that at all. But you know what a miracle is today? Somebody telling the truth. 
that's a miracle today. <laughs> right? I mean, that is a miracle today. All the doctrine that we actually are bold enough to stand up for and proclaim as a church, you know, when you give that to people out in the community, guess what? That is a miracle. And you know what? A lot of times they want to just stop it. Okay, let's park it right here. Tell me more. Read all of Romans 1. Let's go back to Genesis 19. Let's go to Judges 19. Let's talk about Asa. And it's like, that's great. But you haven't got saved yet, okay? I, I, I get it. We have the answer to the tough questions. Like, why does God let pedophiles live? We have all that information. It's crystal clear in the Bible. And we can teach that. But we ought to never compromise the message for the miracle, okay? And we want to have this mindset in us where we just decide, you know what? We're not going to take the effort to make our reputation apart from Christ. What we're going to do is we're going to focus on the message and let him build our reputation. Let him give us the promotion. That's the right mindset. That is how we keep confidential knowledge to ourselves and just disperse it at the right time. Now turn one chapter, or not one chapter, turn several chapters over to uh, Matthew 17, Matthew chapter number 17. What I want to do now is I just want to kind of show you here how the disciples are growing and they're actually learning and they actually do keep a secret. They actually do keep some knowledge concealed here. And I want to show you the benefit of that. So Matthew chapter 17, very familiar passage in the gospels. It's about the transfiguration. So you know the story. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up to the mountain. He's transfigured before them and they get to see this. And they're like, what? What's going on here? <laughs> this is great, right? And the Bible's like, hey, Peter's like, this is great. Let's make a tabernacle for all you guys. And the Bible says he, he didn't even know what he was saying. Now, look at verse number nine. It says this, And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. It's just like we read in Matthew chapter nine. Okay, he charged them. He straightly warned them. He said, hey, don't tell what you saw. Now, if we saw something like this, ooh, that would be hard. It's like, man, I, I've got extra knowledge. I saw into the eternal. Who wouldn't want to tell somebody? But you know what? They're actually growing by this point, and they actually do keep this secret until the right time. And what does that do? Guess what? It protects discipleship. Because by the time you're reading 2 Peter chapter 1, what does Peter say about this? He says, yeah, we saw that. Yeah, that was great. But guess what? We have a more sure word of prophecy. Right? And so now we, in our day and age, we're able to read that and grow and put those two things together and say, wow, Peter, James, and John, keeping that secret until the right time, it protected and enhanced discipleship. That's what it did. It furthered the word of God. And so the whole point here is to be mission oriented with the right message over the fame, the miracles, and all of that stuff that we often get caught up in. Now go to Psalm chapter number 75. Psalm chapter number 75. And you got to give it to him. I mean, studying the life of Peter, you know, he's always sticking his foot in his mouth and stuff like that. And we give him a hard time, but we're no different than he is. Um, actually gets it right here. He actually is able to keep this inside and reveal it at the right time in history. And what do we get? Well, we get an awesome truth that most people today don't believe. Okay. So Psalm 75, I want you to look at verse number six. I've mentioned this several times before. This is some of my favorite verses. I think everybody ought to know these by heart, meditate on this regularly because it's so important. And then look down at verse number six. For promotion cometh neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south. Look at verse 7. But God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. Amen. That is the truth that I've seen over and over and over again in my own personal life. I've seen it in this church over and over and over again. Right? We just hit a thousand subscribers. But you know what? We didn't do it by backstabbing people. We didn't do it by making troll accounts. We didn't do it by, you know, just bringing preachers here just to, to boost our subscriptions. No, we don't do that at all. You know what? Because we realize as a church, someday YouTube's going to go away. Someday Facebook's going to go away. They will cancel us out and we'll have to find another route. But what's important in the meantime? It's the strength of the local church. It's the strength that we have as a church to preach the message over the miracles, not neglecting the miracles, not neglecting the doctrine at all. But what I'm saying is the message has to be more important, right? You know what? Someday I, I think it's probably true. I think someday KTB 
TV or whatever it's called downtown is probably going to want to come in here and find out what we're all about. And you know what they're going to do? They're going to take little clips and stuff and, you know, things that I've said, things that you guys have said, and just throw that out there. And they're going to make the world focus on that over the real message. That's why I said on Wednesday, it's so important how we treat people while we're out soul winning so that we can prepare the community so that when that happens, there's still some people left that say, hey, wait a minute. Those people came to my door and they were very loving. They were very kind. They had a sense of urgency about them and they had the truth. They're not like what you're making them out to be. That is not right. You see, because the world, they don't care about confidentiality. They care about climbing over the next man's back just to get to the top. And there's a lot of preachers out there today who call themselves Baptists that are the same way. A bunch of dirtbag, low-life scumbags that all they want is influence. All they want to do is to get all the subscribers. I got to be in charge. I want to be the man that people look to. That's the wrong way to be. And God will never bless that. And you're starting to see that play out. And if you're confused about what I'm talking about, come see me after the service. I'll fill you in. So you can go ahead and leave your place there in Psalms. Turn to Mark chapter number nine. Mark chapter number nine. So point number one is when we have loose lips, we sink our discipleship. And what does that mean? That means that we need to maintain discipline and keep the things that we know that other people don't know inside until the right time. Okay, until the right time. There is a time to be silent. There is a time to speak. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 talks about that in great detail. And so let's move on to the second one here. Mark chapter number 9. And I want you to look at verse number 28. Verse number 28. So what's going on here is the disciples have been trained to, you know, do, the, do some of the miracles, to, to go out and teach and to do things. But the problem is they run into a person with a devil and they couldn't cast him out. Right. And so now people are like, well, what's going on here? We need to go see Jesus and find out about this. And so the disciples are like, yeah, OK. <laughs> you know, they're kind of like walking away. They got their heads down a little bit. They can't figure out why they weren't successful here. But look at verse 28 it says this. It says, and when he was coming to the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could not we cast him out? And he said unto them, this kind, this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Now, what I find interesting here is that obviously Jesus is all knowing. He's fully man. He's fully God. He knows what happened here, but he waits. He waits for the disciples to come to him privately. See, he doesn't make this thing, this failure that they had open, does he? He waits until they come to him. And you say, well, why did they wait? And why did they go to him privately? Well, the same reason you and I would do it to save embarrassment, <laughs> to save face, and to figure out like what happened. See, not everything that we do wrong needs to be put on blast, needs to be made public. And these guys understood that, and Jesus was okay with that. He waits until they come to him, but why? And here's the second point that I want to make, which will answer that question. When we have loose lips, we sink our leadership. When we have loose lips, we sink our leadership. Think about it. You come to me and you tell me something privately, something that you don't want me to tell other people. And then I go out and I'm like, oh man, you know, Victor, he was slapping people at soul winning on Monday, you know, and he's just got a real problem with that. Well, I just blew it, but <laughs> you know what? Guess what? That becomes a huge problem. Everybody in here is going to lose respect. My influence that I have is gone. My reputation is gone, and now I'm starting over from scratch. Well, guess what? It doesn't just apply to me. It applies to everybody in here. When you have a friend, you have an acquaintance, you have somebody who looks up to you, and this can happen very quickly. I mean, look, you tell somebody you're a Christian. I do this all the time. You know, all of a sudden in the workplace, people don't even know me. They want to tell me their whole life story. You know, my husband left me for a girl who's like 20 years younger. I get this all the time. You know, and they confide in me. You know, but what happens if I just start, you know, going throughout the neighborhood to every call that I go on? Hey, you know, the lady down at 3213, you know, Taconic Drive, she, you know what she told me? That would quickly give me an infamous reputation. And we don't want that because all that does is do harm, hurt people. And like I said, we want to be known for a people that provides comfort. And one of the ways you can do that is by being looked up to as a person that can keep things in house. Somebody who can keep things confidential. This is such a rare trait today. It is so difficult to find somebody who can actually keep a matter private. We had somebody in this church who used to think they could keep a matter private or who, you know, Oh, you don't know the whole matter. I can keep it private, but pastor can't. And to this day, we still don't know what it is. So he's good at that aspect. <laughs> 
right? He's good at that, but terrible at speaking when the time is right. So point number two, when we have loose lips, we can and we will sink our leadership. It hurts your influence. You say, well, I don't have a position of leadership. Yes, you do. You are a born again, Bible believing Christian. If you're saved, you are a king and a priest. You're automatically grafted into leadership. And we have to start living like that. Like we understand that. Like we know that. Because again, what happens when you're out and you're at work or you're in the community, you're talking with these people that aren't saved. What happens when they confide in you? And they realize, you know what, that's somebody I can trust. That's somebody I can confide in. Well, you know what? It helps to break down that pride that they have. And there's going to come a point in time where you can capitalize on that and give them the gospel. It happens all the time. Not everybody gets saved with the first knock of the door. Some people do. Some people are tough. Some people have had a lot of bad things happen in their lives. And they don't know who they can trust. But they ought to be able to trust people like us people that are indwelt with the Holy Ghost, people who say and proclaim the name of Christ, they should be able to look to us and say, you know what? That's somebody I can find comfort in. And when you build that reputation in yourself around the people that are in your life, you know what? It is only going to further the gospel. It's going to help your leadership. And guess what? The numbers go up and the kingdom of God grows. And that's the whole reason why we're here is to grow the kingdom of God, to fight these battles, to do what the Lord Jesus Christ wants us to do. Now go to Proverbs chapter... Uh, Number 18, Proverbs chapter number 18. Proverbs chapter number 18. Look at verse 21, Proverbs 18, 21. James talks about the same subject here. It says this, death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. So we need to realize that we have the power with our tongues to bring somebody up or to put somebody down. And you say, well, how do I know when to tell? How do I know when to tell something? Or, you know, because sometimes it can be confusing. Like somebody will, you know, maybe confide in you a little bit. They'll they'll say something, but you hear them telling like everybody else in in the church. Here's, Here's a good rule of thumb. If you have to ask yourself inside, like, should I tell somebody? You probably shouldn't. You know, just to, it's always better to be safe than sorry, right? It's always better to be safe than sorry. So if you're like, I'm not sure. I know he's telling everybody else, but I'll just play it safe. Nothing's going to be, you know, nothing bad is going to happen to you. You're going to be okay. You know, and now let other people do it. <laughs> you know? Let other people do it. Because I've, I've had that before where people, where I've been in a place and, you know, somebody's telling about this certain problem they have, right? And they tell like literally everyone. And then everyone starts talking about it and they get mad and they get offended. And it's like, well, you know, that's kind of on you because you did go around and tell everybody. You can't go into a church and tell 40 people to keep something secret. <laughs> it's the same thing. You know, it's like you do realize you're telling everybody this. The walls are thin. I even heard you. So it's not like I'm discovering a secret because you told everybody. But some people, they just want drama. They just want that bad drama. They want a reason to fight. They want a reason to just sow contention. And some people will do that. They'll go around, they'll tell everybody, and they'll, oh, well, you broke protocol. You went and told what? It's like, you told everybody. <laughs> it's not a secret anymore if you tell everybody. Good night. Turn to Matthew chapter number seven. Matthew chapter number seven. And so the application here is we need to build people up. You know, just because somebody is not on our level, right, doesn't mean that we need to drive them out. You know, uh, when this church first started, it's a perfect example of this. There was a situation where a person ordered a, an alcoholic beverage at a restaurant, okay? And I, I, can't, I don't know, I'm looking out here, I can't remember who was there. Uh, I, it was before I moved here. But thinking about this sermon, about the situation last night, I was like, a lot of you, if you were there, were, were, were pretty wise. You know, we're, we're pretty prudent already, you know, before this church even started. Because there's only one guy that instantly sent me a text message, instantly called me. And when I brought this up, you know, brother Mike was like, like I could tell like he knew about it, but he kept it private. And why did he do that? Because he wanted to try to help the individual out. He wanted to try to build that person up. It was not out for blood, not out to, to proclaim everyone's business. And it's like, yeah, of course the guy shouldn't have done that. Of course that's wrong. But what about keeping a matter to yourself? And actually he's done that several times since this church has started. A lot of you have, 
But in that story in particular, I remember, like, I tell you, he knew about it, but he kept it private. Not because he's trying to like pull one over on us. No, he's trying to help somebody out. Yeah. Trying to build somebody up. And that's what we should be about. But this guy orders out beverage, you know, and it's like this one guy just constantly, we need to have a talk. As soon as you move here, there's drunkards in the church. <sighs> drunkards or a drunkard. You know, and by the way, there's a big difference between being a drunkard and somebody who just drinks casually. Because I'm not going to lie to you, there are people that can handle it. I don't recommend it. I'm against it. But there are people that can handle it. <laughs> and I wouldn't classify them as drunkards or people that need to be, oh, you sipped on a beer? I'm going to kick you right out of church. Look, let's be a place of safety and try to help some people out. But this guy who texted me and then had to call me, guess what? He, I'm going to call you next Friday. We got to talk about this again. Right? Guess what? As soon as my U-Haul touched the curb where I live, this fool was like, hey, don't forget, I heard you're in town. I saw the Facebook pictures. I figured, you know, it was a couple hours ago, you're in the Owyhee Mountains. I, you're here. We got to talk tomorrow. Do you have time tomorrow? It's like, dude, I, I'm starting to like, I need to call Pastor Mendes. You know, maybe we should wait a little longer, you know? Is this really what it's going to be like? Good night. But man, that is a perfect example of having loose lips. That literally, in my eyes that day, it sunk that individual's leadership to me. I realized, you know what? This is just somebody I absolutely don't think we can help and somebody I, I know for sure we can't trust. And all you guys already knew way more than I did. And it's like, <laughs> yep, that's it. That's true. But you can see how that works, right? If he would, if he would have just had some wisdom, some prudence said, hey, no, I'm just going to pray for you. Let's just keep this in house. It's all good. It's not, you know, he's not hurting anybody else. Is he hurting himself? Yes. But you can have a conversation with somebody and say, hey, let's just hash this out. Let's talk about this. Let me show you why I have concerns about this. Because you know what happened? The guy's like, you know, I struggle with this. It's just, I don't know any different. And I'm not vouching for that guy. So that dude's a whole other sermon by himself. But what I'm saying is, you know, we should always seek to help before we try to hurt. Okay. Yeah. That is what we need to do. Uh, Matthew chapter number seven. We're going to take a look at one verse here. We're going to move on to my third point. Matthew seven. Look at verse number 12. It says this. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. And so we're just going to take that one verse right there because that says so much. I mean, you can build sermon after sermon after sermon on this. And of course, this is a verse that many liberals like to twist. And this is the only thing they want to focus on. This is their mission. This is their miracle. Oh, this is a golden rule here. This is all we need. This is the only verse we need. We don't need to read the Bible. We just need one verse and it's this right here. Okay. We don't need to deal with those types of people. But here's what this verse means for us in this point. When we have loose lips, we sink relationships. Think about it. When we have loose lips, we sink our relationships, whether they're small or great. Because the idea here is you meet somebody, you have an acquaintance. The idea is to turn those acquaintances into good relationships. This is how we build church. This is how we grow is by taking people that just aren't sure, that just aren't quite plugged in yet, right? And building that confidence, building that trust. And part of that comes with us being able to conceal a matter, with us being able to help a person out, not just blab their business to everyone because then guess what? They don't feel safe. And there's tons of churches out there. You know, a lot of people will say, you know, the reason why I like to go to the big church is because nobody knows what's going on. I could just slip in and slip out. He's like, you know, they're like the smaller churches are difficult because everybody knows everything. And that's true to a certain extent. But we can still be a small church like we are and be a place of confidence, be a place uh, just as a safe haven, a place where relationships grow. Right. Where we go out and we tell people, hey, this is a safe haven. You can come here. I get it. You know, a lot of us have ties and shirts. and We have high standards and we do all these things. That's great. Right, but that doesn't mean that we're better than anybody else. That doesn't mean that we're be I'm better than you. No, we're saved sinners just like anybody else that's saved. Amen. Right, and we need to sometimes just be brought back down to that and keep that in mind. Turn to Proverbs chapter number 17. Proverbs chapter number 17. So point number three, when we have loose lips, we sink relationships. It's very simple, very sticky to remember. You know, as soon as you take something that someone's confided in you and you make that common, they instantly don't trust you. Even if they keep coming back to you, even if, you know, it doesn't seem like there's a problem, 
Something inside of that individual is saying, don't trust, don't trust, don't move forward, do not proceed. You know it's true. It is 100% true. That is the way it works. So when we have loose lips, we sink our relationships. Now look at Proverbs 17 and verse number 9. It says this, He that covereth a transgression seeketh love, but he that repeateth the matter separateth very friends. And isn't that the truth? I used to work with this guy and I mean, he was the, the best tail bearer I've ever met in my life. I mean, anything you say, this dude was instantly running to other crews, calling people on the phone, even about stuff that didn't matter. Oh, like, you know what? Jones likes to eat, drink during lunch, likes to drink this grape juice. And it's like, who cares? Why do you, you know, just anything. And this guy, this individual, he became the most hated person out of the entire organization over there. I am serious. This guy would take anything you said. You think you could tell him a secret? And look, you know how they get you? They flatter you, right? They try to button right up next to you and they'll tell you great things. Oh, your hair is, oh man, you're, you're so strong. Oh dude, you're, you're tough. Oh, you're whatever, right? They'll just try to flatter you to get you to lower your guard. Then they extract that secret from you. And the next thing you know, man, they're just running all over the place, just sprinkling that thing everywhere. And you know what? I could never be friends with that guy. And, and to this day, you know, he still texts me and still calls me. Hey, man, what's going on? Right? It's always, that, that's always the first day. Hey, what's going on? Like, he wants to know everything. Like, like what we're doing here, like, like why I moved here and stuff. And it's just like, what do you do? You know, just don't tell him anything. You find out for yourself because he, he's just going to run with it. You know, oh, you know, they preach all this, you know, and just, just cause trouble. I mean, think about it. It took one tail bearer to have over 3,000 people on Facebook when this church first started to hate our guts. To the point to where we actually, Skoke and I knocked on someone's door and she was like, you're that guy from the internet. I've seen you. You're rude or your pastor's rude. I'm like, I am the pastor. What are you talking about? <laughs> well, he's really rude. That's not how a pastor should act. Well, we should read the Bible. Amen. We should read the Bible. Right? That sunk a lot of relationships. I mean, it was hard to get her back to thinking that we're not a cult and we're not. I mean, we had to like help her move. We literally had to take over Goodwill on Overland just to get rid of her stuff because she was moving. And guess what? We saw her downtown not too long ago where, where Stephen lives. But, you know, that was hard work. It took one person to try to ruin the reputation of this church. She even contacted the news. And I think the only reason they didn't run with it is because we just didn't have enough material online yet. The next time might be a different story. Right. It might be a different story. But what does this verse say here? He that covereth a transgression seeketh love. Now, look, obviously there are some things. If somebody's talking trash about me, let me know. Okay? Because I'm commanded to not let anyone despise me. You're, you know, you shouldn't let anyone despise you. You know, if somebody's running their mouth about you. You go to that person. You do the Matthew chapter 18 properly and then it escalates there's no resolution there that's when i need to get involved and we need to settle this dispute why because we're always seeking love first we want to build people up we want people to come here and say you know what i feel safe here because guess what you don't feel safe at work there's no i don't think there's anybody in here who has a job where you feel safe where you feel comforted <laughs> right you guys that live in these neighborhoods especially your moms you don't trust your neighbors most of them are absolutely insane they're crazy, right? So this should be the place where you're able to come to and it's like, ah, you know, it really is a breath of fresh air, <laughs> right? Again, we, we got a lot of little in-house jokes. I ain't got time to explain that one. See me after the service. Turn to Proverbs chapter number 20. Proverbs chapter number 20. And so again, you know, one thing that I see hurt relationships, let's start with marriage, is when a husband or a wife takes something that they absolutely hate about their spouse and they go and tell everyone. I see this throughout the week. This is the chief thing that I see. Like, no, I'm not even kidding. It was Friday. I went to a house. It was my first job. I get in there and the guy's like, hey, on my oven, the fan's not working. And the wife, she just starts yelling at him. She's like, you don't know anything. The fan is working. It just won't turn on. They're literally screaming at each other in the living room, right? And then the, the husband's like, I'm out of here. I'm going to go in the garage and do some stuff. She comes up like, he's an idiot. He doesn't know anything. He's just a buffoon. He can't even cook. He can't even use the microwave half the time. And he took this thing apart trying to fix it himself. And that's why we had to call you because he doesn't know what he's doing, right? So I get to doing my thing and she's like, okay, well... I'm going to go, I'm just going to let you be. Well, she goes off and does whatever. He comes out, 
you know, and he's like, she is a witch. He's like, I am so sorry for the way that she has acted in here. And I'm just like super uncomfortable. Like I'm, I'm starting to sweat and he's telling me, stop. I'm like, hold on, man. Look, I got to get this done, dude. Okay. Cause the price is going to go up the longer I'm here. I'll just, I just, just need to figure this out. He's like, okay, that's fine. But I just want to let you know, man, she's just, we always fight like this. I was like, I can tell. It's, it's okay. <laughs> I said, I can tell. It's okay. And he's like, wow. But they were just, just digging on each other hard. And obviously they're not saved, but you know, I was just thinking, you know, what, what damage does that cause? You know what? They're the kind of people that the neighbors call the cops on at two o'clock in the morning because they're just out there and just arguing and fighting. And you know what? In that same neighborhood, this is off of Eagle Road to kind of drive the, the, the nice homes out there. You know what? I went to a house not too far from my second call and they actually knew those people. They're like, you had a busy day? I was like, oh, no, kind of just came from this house on the corner of uh, Taconic and uh, Amity. And, oh, was it? And they told me the name. And I was like, yeah. Oh. <laughs> and they just kind of smiled like, oh, we know them very well. And it's because those two go throughout the neighborhood running their mouths about each other. That's what they do. It's crazy. This guy's like, I can't wait to get to work. He's like, as soon as you tell me what's wrong with this thing, I'm out of here. I'm going to work and I'm going to try to work as much overtime as I can. Right. And it was just like this for an hour, just back and forth. And I'm like, that is a relationship that is hurt because both of them can't keep it internal. What do you think would happen if they committed for just three months to just not tell anybody what they hate about each other? You know how much better that they would be? You know how much better and how much stronger their marriage would be? Three months. It's like, give me 90 days where you don't say anything bad. You keep fight inside your bedroom, you know, do whatever you got to do. Try to keep it quiet so the neighbors don't call the cops, but have your beef and don't discover a secret to another. If you would do that, you know what? I believe that their relationship would be, would be a whole lot better because here's what I know. I'll bet in five years, they're not married anymore. Cause obviously this thing's just terrible. It's terrible. Right. And you say, well, I'm not married. I don't have to worry about it. Yeah, you do because any relationship involves communication, confidence, you know, all of these things that we're talking about. We need to learn how to keep some things private, not to discover a secret to another, not to keep blabbering it, right? To have Proverbs 17, 9. We want to cover a transgression. So if your friend or your spouse or whatever does something that you don't like, you know, try not to tell other people. And you know what? It's hard, isn't it? Boy, it's hard because I get it. You know, people come, come to me all the time or they'll call the church phone, you know, Hey, I'm on board. I'm saved. You know, my wife, I don't know, but you know, she wears pants and it's like, okay, I look, I get it. I, you want to be like all Baptist up. No problem. Hey, I love it. Great. But you know, don't tell other people. I get you calling me, but don't be like telling other people in your church or telling your coworkers because all that's going to do is hinder your progress because now she's going to lose trust in you. And so why would she do what you want her to do if you're just constantly telling other people? It's a terrible, terrible thing. So we want to try to cover transgressions, light ones first to seek love, to build each other up, to make this a safe place. Now, Proverbs 20, look at verse number 19. It says this, he that goeth about as a talebearer revealeth secrets. Now here's what we need to do about Read the rest of the verse. Therefore, meddle not with him that flattereth with the lips. So people that will not cease from tail bearing, like Josh, I'm just going to say it because it's the perfect example. Don't meddle with these people. Don't be friends with them because they will not stop. It's sad, but it's true. There are some people that just love it too much and they can't cease from it and they need to be taught a lesson. They need to be removed because when you tell somebody, Hey, you know what, what you're telling me right now is wrong. What you're telling me right now is not wise. It doesn't help anybody out. And you call them out, you put them to shame. Then guess what? Their reputation becomes infamous, just like God said it would. That is designed to help that person, hopefully in the future, because maybe someday the next time he goes and tries to tell somebody someone's secret, he's going to remember the pain that he felt when he told the wrong person. You want to be that wrong person. You want to be that person that says, Hey, you know what? What you're saying right now is wrong. It's not wise. Hey, let's go get the pastor. Let's go bring him over here. And, and why don't you tell him what you just said that he's in this for the money that he doesn't have enough time to prepare these sermons, whatever it is. Let's have a chat. Let's have a talk. And you say, yeah, let, we're doing that to hate him. No, we're doing that to teach that individual a lesson. 
You don't belong in a group of people that have love, that want to edify the kingdom of God, and that want to see this thing succeed. It just is the way it is. Now, we are almost done. I'm going to wrap this thing up here. So turn to Proverbs 13. Turn to Proverbs chapter number 13. And so the first point was what? When we have loose lips, we sink our discipleship, okay? What does that mean? That means we need to keep things that we know, you know, that are, that are just miraculous, you know, this information, and we need to keep that for the right time. It doesn't mean we keep it secret because we don't want to be on the news or we don't want people to think whatever about us. No, we want the gospel to be the priority. And then after people get saved, that's when we bring in the other doctrines. That's when we teach them the truth of the word of God. We don't want to just exalt that other stuff for the sole purpose of building up our reputation, building up our media, whatever, right? We want to be mission oriented, message over miracle. So when we have loose lips and we don't keep the things secret that need to be kept secret at the right time, we hurt our discipleship. Okay. And we took a look at what Peter, James, and John did and how they kept the events at the Mount of Transfiguration secret. And what did that do? It furthered the word of God. It protected discipleship. And then the second one, was our leadership. When we have loose lips, we hurt our reputation. We sink our leadership, which everyone in this room has. If you're saved, you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, you say, I don't have a leadership role. That's fine. That's okay. You are still a leader. You're a king. You're a priest in this kingdom here, and we have to act like it. And when we go running around just telling everyone's business, we lose confidence in people. And then we're going to be a church that nobody wants to come to anymore. And we can't have that. We don't want that. And point number three is when we have loose lips, we sink our relationships. Right? The stronger that our relationships get inside this church, and that's what I love about these types of churches like this, is we have good fellowship. Right? It's not just about you coming here to hear me run my mouth three times a week. It's about what happens before, what happens after, and what happens in between. It's all connected together. Right? It's about building up relationships and being a place that we can all come to and trust. Because there's nothing more refreshing than having a problem, struggling with something, and being able to go to somebody and confide in that person and know I can trust this person to pray for me and to help me out. That is what this is all about. And so we're going to wrap this up here. I want you to look at Proverbs 13 and verse number 3. It says this, He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life. But he that openeth wide his lips shall have destruction. It's that simple. There's no middle road here. We learn to keep our mouths. Guess what? We have made this place a safe haven as it should be, as it ought to be. Now turn over to Psalm uh, chapter 141. Psalm chapter 141. And you'll see this just over and over and over again in the Bible. You know, loose lips sink ships. Proverbs 141, and we're getting very close to being done here. I want you to look at verse number three. Psalm 141, look at verse three. It says, set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. This is something that if you really struggle with keeping things secret, memorize this verse. And I guarantee you after a couple months, you're going to get way better at it. It's a promise. It's a guarantee. Look, the psalmist here, he's having to actually ask for help with this. And this is what we miss oftentimes as believers. We need to get help for ourselves because it's so tempting to want to always tell other people's business. I struggle with it. You struggle. We all struggle with this. But when we ask the Lord to help us out, you know what? He's going to do that. He's going to help us to keep the door of our lips. And all this does when you master this, when you become that person, you become leadership instantly in your workplace, in your families, in your neighborhoods, everywhere, because you're a person that can control themselves. You can keep your bearing. Okay. Look at the next verse. Look at verse number four. It says this, incline not my heart to any evil thing to practice wicked works with men that work iniquity and let me not eat of their dainties. So their dainties, their desserts, right? The world's desserts is always the gossip. It's always the juice. That's why when you go to Fred Meyer and you go to the checkout section, it's always the gossip magazines. Oh, Prince Charles has like five wives, or, you know, or there's aliens coming down and even Tucker Carlson agrees. You know, it's just always something goofy like that because that sells. I can remember being a child in, safe, in line at Safeway or Albertsons. They always used to have this stupid black and white newspaper. Anybody remember that? And it was always just the most far out there bizarre stuff. 
You know what's sad about that is a lot of that stuff is kind of like what's being pushed today as like real news. I never thought I would see the day. I'd go to school, we'd always talk about that stupid black and white newspaper. What is it, like the National Enquirer? The Enquirer, right? Guess what? A lot of that stuff is like mainstream news nowadays, you know what I mean? But that's the dainty of the world. That's what draws us away from the cause of Christ. That's what um, basically causes us to fall into iniquity and to fall into practicing wicked works is because we didn't take the advice of the Proverbs and meddle not with people that just want to be tail bearers and sow discord and so on and so forth. Last verse, I want to look at Proverbs 11. Proverbs chapter number 11. So basically, another lesson is this. What happens at church? You know, it needs to stay at church. The world has their philosophy, right? Well, what happens at Vegas stays at Vegas, which isn't true. What happens in Vegas is going to wind up going to hell, okay? <laughs> because the Lord sees that stuff there. And someday is going to send a big fireball to Las Vegas. It's true. I read it. <laughs> All right. Proverbs 11, look at verse 13. A talebearer revealeth secrets. Say, what's a talebearer? It's somebody who reveals secrets, somebody who cannot keep things confidential. A talebearer revealeth secrets, but he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. And that is the goal. That is the desire that I have for myself. I believe that's the desire that we have as a church is to be a people that can conceal a matter. And sometimes you actually got to tell somebody what that matter is. Okay. <laughs> right? You know, if you need help, don't keep the matter private and then come blast us for not giving them, you know, solving the matter. But when you get that, you know, that, that confidence, when somebody confides in you and tells you a secret, keep that thing private if that is their desire or even if you're, un you know, you're unsure. And so again, the bottom line, when I take that which is confidential and I make it common, I ruin my reputation. The whole sermon can really just be boiled down to that statement there. When we take something that's confidential and we make it common, we've ruined our reputation. You have now gone from a person of confidence to a person that is a talebearer, just that quick. And it happens so fast. There used to be the saying in the military, you can go from hero to zero in 60 seconds. And you know where that wisdom came from? It came from this book right here. It came from the Bible. So let's remember that and be a people of confidence. Be a church where people can look to it and say, you know what? These people came to my door. I told them my whole life story and I felt good. I felt like they understood. They actually cared about me. They actually understood, you know, and because the next time you run into that person, guess what? They might actually listen. They might actually get saved. Yeah. It is so, so true. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Thank you so much, Lord, for this church. And thank you for all that you've uh, allowed us to go through all the, the, the trials and stuff that we've uh, been through that you've, you've rescued us from, Lord. And I just uh, pray that we would be that church that is uh, able to keep the secret things secret, Lord. We understand that the secret things belong to you, but what's been revealed is for us to use wisely. And we just pray that you'd be with us for the rest of the day, Lord. Please bless the soul winning and the fellowship after the service. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.